And thank you so much for joining us uh, for PassFouse 101 today. I'm Aaron Gunnarsson with PassFouse Massachusetts, so I'll be leading the session today. Uh, I have a lot to go through in, in the time here, but hopefully going to make it as beneficial for you folks as possible. So feel free to ask some questions. Um, I have the chat room open so I can see your, your responses there. So type in what, what you like. Um, what you'd like to see me discuss more, what questions you have about the slides I'm presenting, uh, some things I can get to during the presentation, other things I'll get to at the end when we can have a full Q&A. Mm, for now though, thank you again so much for being here. I'm looking forward to, uh, to the session today. So welcome to PassFouse 101. So as I said, my name is Aaron Gunnarsson. I'm with uh, PassFouse Massachusetts. Here's a, a little bit about me. Um, but really, I want to thank uh, MassSave today for hosting this presentation um, and putting together the Passive House training program that's been going on now for, for well, almost a couple of years here. Uh, we did a lot of in-person events, and now we transitioned to a lot of virtual events like this. So thank you to MassSave and the sponsors of MassSave. Um, there's an email there for the past house training um, program that you can reach out to if you have any questions about it or uh, we provide a lot of sessions directly to companies and firms and organizations as well so you can reach out about that if you have questions. There are other uh, mass save incentives related to passive house for projects and for um, accreditation trainings uh, so I'll mention those uh, things at the end of today's presentation. But here's a little bit about what we're going to go through today. Um, really, we're going to talk about what, what is Passive House. Obviously, that's why we're here for a 101. We're going to go into a little bit of the certification and metrics about sort of the numbers behind what the Passive House standard is. Then we're going to spend a lot of time talking about some of the design and construction uh, principles and strategies that go into these projects. So what are, what are buildings actually doing to achieve these metrics? Uh, we'll look at some actual examples of built projects. Uh, we'll look at some lessons learned from some of the project teams, some of the things that they have to share. And like I said uh, just a moment ago, we'll end with some of the current mass save incentives on buildings and for, and for us uh, and professionals to go through trainings. Um, so again, thank you for being here and ask as many questions as you like in the chat room during the presentation. Uh, first, I always like to start off by showing a, a few photos of some actual Passive House buildings. I think part of the part of the, the name uh, behind Passive House uh, less, uh, leads people to thinking of, well, thinking of a home. The first time they hear Passive House, they think of, well, just, just a house. And that's true. Passive House buildings are certainly homes, uh, but they can be all kinds of buildings. They can be large multifamily buildings, like some of the ones you're seeing here. They can be office buildings. Um, they can be even uh, uh, schools or even university residence halls. So here are some examples of all different types of buildings. You have a, a big home there out in Wayland. You have a couple um, uh, multifamily buildings. That one in the center there is a passive house office, uh, the one with the solar panels on it. And the one at the bottom is uh, a new residence hall at Wheaton College. So all these are passive house buildings. At the same time, they can be kind of tall, you know, office buildings like these ones or tall skyscrapers, if you will. Um, the one on the right there is uh, a new building for Cornell Tech in on Roosevelt Island, New York City. And the one on the left, the conceptual image there is Winthrop Square Tower that's going up right now in downtown Boston. It's going to feature the largest uh, square footage of passive house space in the world when it's finished. Um, so passive house building can really be, be anything, residential, office, small, large, um, schools, all different types of, of buildings. They can even be retrofits. So this is a picture of some row houses in Brooklyn. Uh, one of them was retrofitted to become a, a passive house. Um, it's a little bit hard to see from just this image, but if you look at the thermal, thermal image, now you can tell. So this was obviously taken in winter, the thermal camera image, and you can see the, the red, green, yellow colors, that's all heat escaping from, from the buildings. That one in the center, that's all blue, that's the one that was retrofitted to become a passive house. And that's what, you know, on a thermal image in winter, we want a passive house to look like. It's like throwing a big blanket over the building and trapping all that heat in. So what is passive house? It is a performance-based building certification standard that focuses on the dramatic reduction of energy use. Uh, so the things that I highlighted there in orange, I think are the are the big takeaways. It's performance-based, number one. So rather than being a checklist of criteria or requirements uh, of, of design or building, it's, it's a performance based. And we'll talk about what some of the performance metrics are in a little bit. And then it also focuses on the reduction of energy use. That's the main point of Passive House, uh, really zeroing in on the energy use of a building and reducing that as much as possible. 
And it does that um, primarily by focusing on space heating. Um, so, uh, sorry, space conditioning. So heating and cooling in the building. Um, Passivos does address overall energy use in the building as well. So things like plug loads and everything else that goes into the energy demand of a building. Um, but it was really built around and the criteria, as you'll see in a moment, really built around reducing the need for heating and cooling in buildings as they tend to be the largest sources of, of energy use. Um, they're the biggest opportunity for energy reductions. What you achieve through Passive House is obviously a dramatic reduction in overall energy use, um, but you also see a dramatic reduction in carbon emissions, um, which to be quite honest is the real point behind it all. The focus on reducing energy use is to reduce carbon emissions associated with energy. But beyond that, you also see improvement a proven improvement in air quality, um, occupant health and occupant comfort, a greater build, a building durability, so longer lasting buildings, better construction. You see more resilience uh, to major weather events and power outages, uh, lower operating costs. Of course, from uh, using less energy, you have lower utility bills, but you also see uh, lower, say, maintenance um, um, related um, costs around some of the equipment because you have uh, a smaller mechanical equipment being used. And you also have a pathway to net zero. So I'll hit on a few of these here as we go through the presentation, talk a little bit more about them in depth. But these are some of the main benefits that you see through passive house buildings. So we'll start with that first one, energy reduction. What that is, is, is a 90% or greater reduction in, in heating and cooling loads compared to a typical building. Um, so this is not, you know, this is a goal, but it's also what projects are actually hitting because it's a performance-based standard. This is what you need to achieve. So you're seeing a 90% or greater reduction in those heating and cooling loads, which I mentioned is the focus of a pass house building is that heating and cooling. But pass house buildings also address overall energy use. So on average, you see about a 60 70% reduction in overall energy use compared to a typical building. So when you factor in all the other sources of energy demand in a building, plug loads, um, water heating, everything else that goes into an energy demand, you got about a 60 to 70% overall reduction. And that leads to what we've seen is a 30 to 45% reduction in carbon emissions compared to stretch code buildings here in Massachusetts. So I mentioned stretch code buildings because most communities in Massachusetts are part of, are, are signed up to the stretch code. Um, so that goes a little bit beyond the regular base code, which means you're already building by default a better building uh, when you build it to the stretch code. But passive house goes significantly beyond that. So you can see on this chart here, the, the column on the left are stretch code buildings. And this is showing you the, the EUI of these buildings, or in other words, the KBTUs of energy they use per square foot. Um, and these are actual built projects that you're, you're kind of getting a look at, but you can see the stretch code buildings fall around you know, anywhere from 28 up to 38 or so UI. The, the passive house buildings, which are all the way on the right, the ones labeled FIAS plus 2015, which is one of the passive house standards, and that's what these ones were built to, are right there around 20. So you can see a pretty significant reduction from stretch code itself. Now, if we were looking at base code, that would be off this chart, well above 40 in the UI, um, closer to 50, 55 for, for most base code buildings. But when you get in that stretch code, you have a little bit of improvement. Now you get the passive house and you have that pretty significant improvement. Some of the other benefits, as I mentioned, are air quality, health, occupant comfort. So what do I mean by this? So one is we see a continuous ventilation of filtered air into these buildings, which means you're getting fresh uh, filtered air into the building. You're taking all the, the dirty, polluted air out. We're also seeing an increased use of non-toxic materials. This is not necessarily a requirement of the standard to use non-toxic materials, but it's sort of a, a byproduct, if you will, um, because of the you know everything else that goes into making these buildings and, and constructing them, the materials that are used, you tend to see an increased use of, of healthier and non-toxic materials. We also see a more consistent and comfortable uh, room temperatures. So you have less variation from room to room in the temperature. You also have less variation within rooms themselves. So whether you're by the window or you're standing someplace else in the room, the temperature is gonna be much more consistent. And along with that is an elimination of air drafts. So from leaky windows or other places in the building where you might typically have some air drafts, these are, these are gone in the past house buildings. Um, another sort of byproduct is an increased uh, uh, natural lighting. So we do want to encourage a lot of sunlight in the buildings for heat in the winter, especially. And that lends itself to usually more windows or more south facing windows and increased natural lighting. And lastly, you'll see noted are quieter acoustic conditions. This is also a uh, sort of a byproduct of the standard by, by doing things like I showed you at the beginning, that putting that big blanket over the house to trap heat in. You're also making things a lot quieter. So you're keeping some of the noise from the street out. 
Um, and also the mechanical equipment that's being used that we'll talk about it in a moment it tends to be a lot quieter as well. So you're producing less um, noise in the buildings as well. Durability and resilience, I mentioned these a bit as well. So kind of what I mean by this is the ability to shelter in place. So uh, that means you can maintain consistent indoor temperatures even during say extreme weather or power outages. Um, so the, the even if the heating system itself is out, the building itself can keep that heat in for quite a long time, um, generally well until the, you know, the, the power comes back on. So you can withstand those, those outages. Um, there's also more, you know, just durable and longer lasting construction methods. So you're seeing buildings that are built to built to last, uh, built, you know, for, for many, many years. And they do that by resisting mold and rot, pests, and of course, water intrusion and moisture issues, which would be a downfall to a lot of projects. And then the last one there is sort of like the top shelter in place, but it's passive knocked active. Basically, you have a lower reliance on mechanical systems, which means there's less things to fail, less things to replace. Um, and the last thing I want to hit on here is one of the benefits is a pathway to net zero. So passive house buildings by, by definition are not net zero necessarily. They don't have to be part of the criteria, but they do provide an excellent pathway to become net zero. And many passive house buildings are because of that. And what this pathway means is that the reality is for most projects, most buildings out there, um, they don't have enough space um, to put solar panels on, on site or they don't have enough realistic options to buy it off site to become net zero simply because they use too much energy. The first step to becoming net zero is reducing energy use. And that's sort of what that graph at the bottom there is showing you, that in order for a typical house uh, to be net zero, you would need a 75% reduction in, in energy demand. And that's what Passive House provides. First, use Passive House measures to reduce the amount of energy, and then you can add renewables to meet that lower energy demand. So let's talk about some of the features of Passive House buildings. How are buildings actually built? How are they achieving this? these standards, mainly through through these methods. We're going to go into depth in, in each of these here in a moment, uh, but these are sort of the, well, the bullet points. Continuous thermal insulation, so that's the blanket that you throw over the house. Thermal bridge-free construction, so these are places within the envelope where heat can transfer, whether they're wood studs or steel studs or fasteners or other places where, where heat can transfer through that wall where there is an insulation. We want to eliminate those or at the very least reduce them. Um, an airtight envelope, so eliminating air gaps in the building, places where air can leak in and out. Um, using better quality windows and doors. Um, having optimized solar heat gain. So as I mentioned, we want to encourage some heat gain in the winter months and also reduce it in the summer months. Uh, balanced ventilation. So even though we put that big blanket in that airtight envelope around the house, we want to provide fresh air into the building and ventilation. So there are ventilation systems to use and we'll talk about what those are here in a moment. Um, and efficient and minimized mechanical systems. So getting into the heating, cooling systems, even the hot water systems. Uh, these buildings still have all of these systems, of course, but we want to minimize them and make them much, much more efficient so they use less energy. So these are sort of the main features. We'll give some examples of these in a moment. Before I do, I want to get into the standard, or sorry, here we go, the metric itself. So what are pass house buildings judged on or how are they, how, how do you become a pass house building? What criteria do you have to meet? So the, the requirements are based on sort of two main areas, performance criteria, and then these sort of other uh, criteria or soft criteria as they are sometimes called. The main ones and the ones we're gonna focus on today are the performance criteria. This is criteria for heating and cooling demand. So the, so the amount of energy you can use in the building for heating and cooling. Um, whole building air tightness. So this is actually measured on site with uh, say blower door test to make sure the building is, is as airtight as possible. And then source energy demand, or in other words, overall energy demand of the building. So again, when you take heating, cooling, and then add in all the other energy sources, plug lows, water heating, et cetera. So there's performance criteria for all of these. Um, the other criteria or soft criteria includes things like ventilation rates, moisture and humidity management, quality assurance. There's other things that go into it. Um, and these can vary a little bit, but, but this is sort of the, the main areas that pass house buildings are, are sort of judged on. This comes from two different organizations that sort of set these standards, the Pass House Institute and the Pass House Institute US or FIAS. Uh, both these organizations uh, certify buildings here in Massachusetts and, and around the US. Um, and they both set and manage their own Pass House standard, their own set of criteria. 
Dark Freight here is very, very similar, but they do have their own set. So if you are you know, building a path health building, you can be certified under either one of these organizations. Um, they both define metrics and criteria, as I mentioned, provide certification for buildings, and they both provide accreditation for professionals as well. So becoming, say, a certified path health consultant or certified path health trade person. So we'll talk about a little of those here as well. But I do want to show you the actual metrics themselves. So here is an example of what the performance criteria is for, for PassFast projects here in the Boston area. So you can see one, one column there for FIAS projects and one column for PHI. As I mentioned, they're very similar criteria, but they are you know, a little different. So you can see some of those differences here. We'll focus on that top one, annual heating demand. What this says is that if you're building a, a project to be certified by FIAS here in Massachusetts or, or here in Boston, I should even clarify more specifically, you have to hit a maximum of 5.3 KPTUs per square foot of the building in heating energy. Uh, and that's per square foot per year. So per year, that's the maximum you're allowed, 5.3 KPTUs. When you look at the PHI standard, it's about 4.8 KPTUs. So very similar, a little different though. And you can see if you jump down to that annual cooling row that for FIAS, it, it drops, it's 2.9 KPTUs. So you have a lower allowance for cooling. Uh, whereas with PHI, it's the same, 4.8. And this is the biggest difference between the FIAS standard and the PHI standard. The FIAS standard is climate specific. So depending on where the project's located, the numbers will look a little different. So here in Boston, as you can tell, the heating allowance is higher than the cooling allowance. If you were to go down to, to Texas or Florida and build a pass house building, those numbers would be swapped around. You would have a much higher cooling allowance than you would a heating allowance. Though on average, the annual heating and cooling energy demand is about the same. With PHI, the numbers are the same no matter where the project's located. Now, I should mention that these numbers are, are just sort of for reference here. Um, the standards for both FIAS and PHI are constantly being updated. Uh, FIAS actually just rolled out their FIAS plus 2021 standards, and PHI has some uh, changes to theirs as well. At the bottom of the slide are, are the links to both organizations' uh, pages for their standards. So if you're actually looking at completing a project, please look at the actual standards and get the up-to-date info on, on what you need to hit for your project. But these numbers are good for, for sort of comparison here and reference and, and kind of generally talking about the, the differences in the standard. Um, the last one I want to hit here is the one at the bottom, source energy. This is that overall energy demand of the project. So again, while there are metrics for heating and cooling, um, Patswell's buildings do have to reduce overall energy use as well. So you can sort of see that the numbers there, they are a little different between the two organizations. With FIAS, uh, the, the source energy demand kind of varies depending on whether you're doing a residential project or commercial project. If it's a residential project, and that includes multifamily residential, it's a per person metric. Uh, so you can see here 3,840 kilowatt hours of energy per person per year. If you're doing a commercial project, it's um, done by that sort of EUI number, KBTUs per square foot of the project. So in this case, 34.8 per year. With PHI, it's that area per square meter or, you know, or uh, energy per area. So 60 kilowatt hours per square meter in this case, which is right around that 34.8 number as well. It's pretty similar. Um, that gives you an idea of what you need to hit to be a passive house. Just to sort of give you another reference on how this compares, that top number, that annual heating number of 5.3 KBDUs, a typical existing say home here in Massachusetts, just a house um, that's you know using say like natural gas for heating, it's probably gonna be around a 50 KBTU per square foot. So you can see it's a pretty significant reduction already in just heating and the other numbers are pretty significant as well. The other metric uh, along with these heating and cooling and, and storage energy criteria is our air tightness. This one is measured on site using a blower door test. Um, so the number for whether it's PHI or, or FIAS, they're measured a little differently, but the number is about 0.6 air changes per hour at 50 Pascal suppressor. That's what you need to hit. You can see what that compares to the current uh, code here in Massachusetts, which is three. So it's a pretty significant reduction from what the current code is. And I will say for, for most projects, especially larger projects, this is the number they're really focused on hitting as this air tightness metric. So when they look at the design and construction of the project, they're really focused on their air tightness um, barrier, their air barrier, their air uh, tightness sort of materials that they're using. And we'll talk about some, some examples of what those are, but this is sort of the key metric for a lot of projects to hit. And just a little bit more about the pass -out standards. As I mentioned, they sort of have, uh, they both sort of have multiple pass certification. Um, you can see here on the left, it's an example of FIAS's, uh, FIAS plus 
2021 standard on the right gives you an example of the PHI standards where they have classic plus premium. So both groups have sort of multiple paths of certification and multiple um, don't necessarily want to say levels, but that's that's the best word I can use right now um, are sort of levels to, to certification. They both have programs for retrofits as well. So if you're looking to retrofit a building, they both sort of recognize that retrofits are a little bit different than new construction. And they ha both have some, some small tweaks to their certification standards for retrofits. They also both recognize uh, renewable energy and that's your goals and offer um, standards for those. Uh, FIAS has their FIAS zero standard and you can see PHI as a, a pass house premium standard that, uh, that work if you have significant renewable energy and net zero uh, or net positive um, billing. Um, and, but regardless of what path you're going down, it's driven by the performance metrics and quality assurance of the project. One last thing on how the passive house standard sort of relates to other standards. So here's a comparison to LEED. The passive house is sort of built on top of a lot of their standards and made to be compatible. It's not really um, an either or situation, though some places are, you know, we'll do LEED or we'll do passive house, but a lot of projects choose to do both. And that's also true of projects that may be achieving other certifications, say living building challenge or, or other certifications that are out there. Um, so that here's one example of how passive house and LEED relate, uh, but LEED is a more holistic standard, has um, a lot of different categories and places that you have to address. Passive house is focused on that energy use. What that means is passive house really hits a lot of uh, points under the energy and atmosphere category for LEED, so you can hit most of your required points with passive house projects. And because of the um, those sort of air quality and health benefits that passive house achieves, it can also uh, earn a lot of indoor environmental quality benefits of LEED. So it really supports a lot of other standards. On top of these uh, performance metrics, there's also a lot of quality assurance uh, metrics and criteria that go into passive house projects. So it's really built around fundamental building science principles, you know, uh, quality control, assurance reviews on site. There's energy modeling that goes into defining how the performance criteria are hit. There's field verifications that are done on site. Um, there's certified training programs for, for designers and builders, and there's third-party verification for these projects. Really, pass fast certification provides this discipline um, that we really need in order to scale up, you know, net zero projects or low energy projects. So I really want to make sure that this is being hit on, that, that it's not just the metrics that are there that you have to hit. Obviously, those are, are very critical, but there's a lot of assurance and quality control that goes into it to make sure that these buildings are being built as designed and are performing as designed quite frankly. So now I want to talk about some examples. And this is where we'll really get into those methods of how you hit a passive house. So we'll show some, some examples of thermal insulation, air tightness, and so on. Uh, first, to show you this project here, this was actually the first passive house project. This was built in Germany in, in the 90s. And you can tell it was a, a multifamily building. So right from the beginning in Europe, they built a lot of multifamily passive houses first. Here in the US, when we started uh, building passive house buildings, there were mostly single family homes at the beginning. And now we're really transitioning into doing a lot of larger projects. So large from multifamilies, commercial buildings, offices, and so on. So I'm going to go through some of the principles of pass house buildings, show some images from built projects of, of kind of how those address those issues. And then we'll go through some actual cases of full, full buildings. So we'll talk about the first, first sort of principle, thermal insulation. This again is that big envelope or that big, uh, sorry, uh, you know, sweater or blanket you put over the building to trap the heat in. The principles behind this are simply having a, a continuous thermal barrier that's around the building. And you achieve this through say dense packing the cavities uh, or, or well, I should say, and having a continuous layer of insulation outside of the frame. The other thing to sort of principle to, to take away from this is the larger the building, the lower the R value. This is what we're seeing in practice. What I mean by this is typically when you build a larger building, a larger multifamily building, the R value or say the size of insulation on the outside of the building becomes less critical. You have more sources of heat inside of the building uh, for one as for one reason. And this just means that that our value becomes less less critical. So we'll give some examples of this here in a moment. So give you kind of some typical values though for what we achieve. You can see here walls, roof, floor, and kind of the typical R value, the typical size of insulation. These are typical. Um, but none of this is required. As I mentioned, Pass House is performance-based. So you can have really any R value in the wall that works to, to hit 
uh, those performance criteria metrics. But on average, this is what we're seeing in projects. So for the walls, for example, about 40 to 50 R value in the entire wall um, with insulation layers around 10 to 12 inches. Uh, give you an example uh, on the bottom there, Finch Cambridge. So this is a multifamily project that was just finished uh, in North Cambridge, 98 units. And both these images are on the right are from that project. So they had, so the cavities, you can see it was a wood stud building and the cavities were dense packed, in this case with blown in fiberglass. So not just, you know, fiberglass bats that you see in a lot of, a lot of homes and, and a lot of us have probably in our homes, um, but they dense packed it. So you blow it in, um, and get it so it's in all the little gaps, it's completely dense as possible, and you, got, you end up with a lot of insulation in those cavities. Then they also put continuous insulation around the outside. So in this case, they used two inches of a rigid mineral wool. So in that image there on the bottom right, that uh, is that brown material that's up on the wall right now. Not the one that's going up on the bottom, but the one that's already existing on, on the full wall. That's mineral wool insulation, and it's put there across the entire building. So air tightness. So this uh, metric, as I mentioned, is measured on site through a blower door test. Um, this is achieved through a continuous air barrier around the entire building. And it's pointed to eliminate air gaps, air holes, air leaks, all these places where, where air can escape. So you can see some examples. These images are all from Finch Cambridge as well. Uh, but that bottom one on the left is showing you um, their air barrier system. In this case, it's a product from Sega. Is that blue material. Now, that's just a blue membrane. And what that does, it goes on, on the building. So they have those, that wood stub, wood stub cavity that's dense packed with fiberglass. They then have a sheathing material that's put over that. And then on top of that is where this air barrier goes. And that's what this blue stuff is. Um, that insulation that we saw, the mineral wool insulation will then go on, on top of this afterwards. The key aspects of this of this air tightness barrier, though, is making sure that it's, it's installed properly and that there's no gaps in the, the insulation or in the air tightness barrier itself. And that every, say, every seam is very, very well taped. You can see that's what they're doing in that image in the top corner. As they're applying tape to the seams and around the penetration, say, where the window uh, goes in and other places, you want to make sure that air barrier is continuous around the whole project and it's no gaps. And they had a sign like that on site to make sure that folks were, were attuned to this uh, every day on the building and they weren't, uh, weren't putting holes in the air barrier. Give you some other examples here. Uh, so you have the one on the bottom left there. This is uh, Elm Place, which is uh, a multifamily building here in New England. They use zip system sheathing, uh, which is becoming more and more common in a lot of projects. This system uh, combines sheathing and an air barrier system. So that's the green product there. And you can see the black tape they use. So just as critical, no matter what air barrier you're using, is making sure all those seams are taped, all the penetrations are taped and covered. Um, and then the one there on the other side, on the right there, is an interior air barrier. So most of the examples I've been showing you has, has the air barrier on the outside of the, of the cavities. In this case, they have it on the inside. So it does vary, and you can do it um, from project to project, depending on what works. Um, but this one, which is a single family home in, in Cambridge, did it on the interior, and they use this white fabric material, uh, Proclima Intello. Um, is the material there. But just as critically, they have their black tape, taping all the seams, taping all the penetrations, penetration, sorry, and making sure that that air barrier is continuous around the project. And just as critically, making sure all the windows and, and uh, electrical box, uh, boxes in every place where there's, say, something going through the wall and going through the air barrier, you want to make sure that that is sealed as well. So you can see these are all Finch Cambridge examples as well, but you can see how they're taping around the air, around the window, how they're folding the air barrier around the edge uh, to make sure it continues. Um, and say for that electrical box there at the bottom, how they're making sure that's completely sealed around the whole thing as well. And if there's gaps, say behind that tape uh, in the in the plywood there, you might actually have even like spray foam insulation that goes in there first to, to completely seal up that, that hole. And here's another example of penetrations. These are of course plumbing penetrations. They're coming through the floor at Finch. The one on the left there, you can see it looks a little messy and they actually said no to this one, made them redo it to look more like the one on the right. So this is an example of making sure that that air tightness barrier is being applied everywhere on the project and being applied by everyone. So in this case, the plumbing trades that come in have to also be, be on the right page and make sure that they're, they're doing the right thing to seal up um, the air barrier around, around those penetrations. One more example here, this is um, 
Mattapan Station, which is a multifamily project that's going up right now in, in Mattapan. Uh, but this gives you an example of how they applied an air barrier and insulation for that matter around um, their um, raised uh, platform. So they have a little parking area underneath that center part of the building, as you can see where the, the blue circle is. And you can see the zoomed in section there. The red line is the air barrier. And you can see how it goes up the project. And then also you can see right around the, that uh, a post there, it sort of turns and they have that overlapped air barrier part of it. That makes sure that there's no gaps even in that little corner area. There's no places where air can leak. You also see the insulation in, in this image that they apply to make sure that that, um, that platform there is well insulated. So I wanna talk about some thermal bridges here now for a second. Um, as I mentioned, um, one of the principles is to eliminate thermal bridges. Honestly, eliminate is probably not the right word. Uh, what we do is reduce the impact of thermal bridges. It's kind of hard to get rid of them completely. But what this is, is places you know in walls, in, in the envelope where heat can, can move through. So okay, say a place where you, maybe have a gap in insulation in the wall. That could be the wood stud or a steel stud, um, or it could be clips or in, in, in other places where you're attaching, um, say, insulation to the wall. You might have a fastener and that fastener could act as a thermal bridge. There's lots of different places where thermal bridges can occur, but the goal here of a passive house project is to reduce their impact. So on the left here, you have an example of Finch Cambridge again, and this is how they attach that mineral insulation to the wall. So you can see the blue thing, it's that air barrier we were talking about. And then they attached the insulation, the mineral wool to the outside of that. And they did it with these clips. So rather than doing any sort of metal fasteners going through the entire wall, they use these plastic clips. So this is a way to keep the, air, keep the a mineral insulation attached to the wall, and, but reduce the impact of the mineral, or sorry, reduce the impact of the thermal bridges. On the right, you can see Elm Place. Elm Place had a kind of a platform construction as well and steel used there and you can see the steel beam. So the vertical steel beam going up um, right where it meets the first horizontal beam. It's a little hard to see in the image, but there's a, a little, uh, there's a, a gray, well, slightly different color gray than steel that's there. And that, that is an insulation, little insulation pad, an insulation layer that goes between the steel beams. Now that's not completely eliminating the thermal bridge, but it's greatly reducing the impact of that, of the thermal bridge that goes through that steel beam. Um, here's sort of an example in a, a different type of building. So we are seeing some curtain wall um, construction methods being used in passive house buildings. This is from um, Winthrop Square, the project that's going up now in downtown Boston. And they're of course using an all glass uh, a building on the outside, all glass design. And you can kind of see a little bit about how they made that work. So on the left there, uh, that image is showing you that the blue line in this case is the air barrier, but you can see how it follows the wall, whether they're doing just regular vision glass or they're doing that spandrel glass, the air barrier needs to be continuous and needs to follow in the right places. And then the section drawing there, you can see a little bit about how they're making that happen, how the air barrier is being moved around. But you can also see how they're managing the insulation and how they're managing the thermal bridges there. Um, there's some notes about where they're putting mineral insulation. Um, you can see a little bit of an example where the say the slab from the from a floor hits that hits the um, hits the wall there and you can see how they have a little bit of mineral wool in between there providing a, a, a thermal break so lots of different ways these things thermal insulation thermal breaks air tightness gets incorporated in projects but the key is to make sure that there's a continuous thermal barrier around the project and a continuous air barrier around the project so talk a little bit about windows and doors. Um, really, this is the only slide on, on windows and doors. Um, there's not a whole lot to say other than making sure you're using high quality windows and doors, efficient windows and doors. But really what that means is ones that are well insulated and sealed um, that have thermal breaks in them and that provide minimal heat loss and eliminate interior condensation. So those are sort of the main aspects that would go into a high quality windows and doors. You can see it's two different ones down here, um, a wood window and an aluminum window from two different manufacturers, but they both look kind of similar. In this case, they're both triple pane windows that have glazing on them that are uh, gas filled. Um, and you can see some of the spacing that's used to break, to provide thermal breaks and condensation breaks. You can see some of the insulation that's used. So you can kind of give me an idea of aspects that go into a high quality window. Now, not every project is going to have triple panes. Uh, there are pass-off projects that are double pane that can get away with that. Um, 
it will vary from project to project, but really the key is having, you know, the ins having the windows be insulated, making sure there's thermal breaks there, and then in the method that it's installed. And as I showed in some of those other images, making sure that the um, uh, window opening itself is, you know, has a good air, air seal around it. The last note there, though, can still be operable. Get a lot of questions, folks, that maybe they don't want windows to open and pass house buildings, not at all. These, these windows can open. A lot of them are, I've seen are, are tilt turn windows where they can open either up or down or, or um, sideways. So there's a lot of open windows, definitely still an aspect in pass house buildings. The other kind of related thing to windows is solar heat gain. So one method of providing heat to pass house buildings uh, in the winter is through, through sunlight. So we want to encourage uh, sunlight coming into the project, coming into the building. That means, you know, a lot of south facing windows or east or west facing windows that can bring the sun in. However, in the summer months, this can lead to overheating if there isn't shading or other methods provided to, to reduce that sunlight coming into the project. So here's some examples of that. On the left is Auburndale Builder's office in, in Newton. You can see that they, uh, they're building there with that. They have a solar awning going across the building. It's actually a net zero project as well. Um, but that solar awning is providing shading. So that is on the south side of the building. And you can see in the drawing below the, the photo there, in the summer months, when the sun is high in the sky, that awning is shading the, the window. So the sun is not coming directly in. But in the winter months, when the sun is much lower on the horizon, the, sh the awning doesn't block it anymore. Now the sunlight comes straight into through the south facing windows and provides a source of heat. And that source of heat is you know, factored into the energy modeling of these projects. So that solar heat gain um, is a critical component of, of, the, of the heating um, sort of element of these buildings. On the right, you can see Finch Cambridge um, and how they employed it there. So the, the side there the, that's sort of facing towards us is the south side of the building. You can see the small little awnings above each of the windows. And that's what they did for solar shading. If you can see on the other side there, that would be the, the west, or sorry, the east side of the building doesn't have any shades. They calculated in their energy modeling that the east side and the west side and the north side for that matter did not need any shades, but the south side did. So that's why the south side has those awnings above it, but the other sides do not. But the key there is that they did, they figured that out through energy modeling. So they sort of worked out <laughs> where they needed them and where they didn't. So get a little bit into heating and cooling. Um, then we can talk about some ventilation as well. So with heating and cooling, mostly what we see are air source heat pumps. There's, there's other things that are out there, but by and large, the, the biggest thing we see, especially in Massachusetts, are, are air source heat pumps. Whether these are being used in single family homes, we see them used in multifamily buildings. Um, we do see other variations of heat pumps, some uh, BRF systems that work very similarly um, in multifamily buildings as well, but kind of the same principle here. These are all electric systems and they provide heating and cooling. So they do, do both of those two things to the project. And they can be centralized or unitized. So what by that, I mean, if you have a multifamily building, you can have a heat pump in every single unit, or you can have say a system that goes to multiple units. They can also be ducted or ductless. So you can have a duct network going through the building delivering the heat. You can also have them as ductless systems where you have the actual, the, the actual head providing the heat or, or cooling right there on the wall. Folks who are unfamiliar with these, I, I think most people are now, they're using a lot of non pass house projects as well, becoming more and more common, but they are incredibly efficient, um, about 300% efficient compared to say a, a high efficiency natural gas boiler, which is maybe 95, 96% efficient. They do that by using the energy, the electricity that goes into them, um, rather than directly creating heat with the electricity, they actually use that to run a compressor. Um, to compress air or at, from outside and, and capture some of the heat energy that's within that air in, in a coolant. So they're actually taking energy out of the air itself, uh, which is why they can be so efficient. Uh, the image you're seeing there on the, the lower left, where there's a, like four of them up on stands, that's the Distillery North, which is a multifamily pass house project in South Boston. And they have, all, they have a unitized approach. So they have one heat pump for every unit. And those are the condensers for the heat pump. Um, sorry, the compressors for the heat pump up on the roof of the building. So I have one of those for every single unit up on a roof. Now for ventilation. Again, kind of like heat pumps, we see basically one, one thing being used, um, though this is much, much more common even than heat pumps are heat recovery ventilators or energy recovery ventilators, um, just variations of the same system. 
because we're you know sealing these buildings up so tight, ventilation is is critical and it's a requirement of these buildings to have ventilation systems. So with an HRB or an ERB, what you're getting is continuously running ventilation system. So it's always on um, all the time in the building. It can run at variable speeds. So it may not, you know, be the fan speed may not be going um, as fast or slow at the same time, but it's always going to be running. And this is providing fresh and filtered air straight into the building. So we'll say an example in the winter months, it's going to be pulling uh, fresh air from outside the building. It's going to be pulling it into this system, which you're seeing the, the drawing of there on the left. It's going to pass that air through a filter. Um, most of these uh, systems come with high rated MERV filters uh, already installed. So you have a pretty high level um, air quality filter. So they're passing them through that filter. And then it goes into a heat exchanger. This heat exchanger is taking some energy from the outgoing air. So from the air that's being pulled from inside the building, that's warmed now in winter and it's passing that through the heat exchanger as well. And it's, the air isn't mixing, but rather it's taking some of the heat energy from the outgoing air and transferring it to the incoming air. So sort of pre-warming that incoming air. And then takes that incoming air that's been pre-warmed and puts it back into the building. And generally these systems are covering you know, 80% or more of the, of the outgoing heat energy from that air. So they're pretty efficient and really, really good at recovering a lot of heat. Uh, what this does is of course, reduce the need to, to reheat that air. But some of the key aspects, continuously running, recovers heat energy and doesn't mix the air. So you're able to have a complete exchange of air within the building. And there are some of the aspects that go into why you have such a high level of indoor air quality in the project. Um, all the things that are producing pollutants within the building, uh, VOCs and particular matter and CO2 that we're breathing out, all of that stuff we do not want in the building is being taken out. And then the fresh air is being passed through a filter and being brought in. So that's how you achieve, well, one of the main ways you achieve such high levels of indoor air quality. Um, one of the things that go into ventilation and go into heating and cooling as well is how you design the placement of these systems. So this is an example of, of sort of the ventilation schedule in a multifamily building, in this case, Mattapan Station, that's going up in, in uh, Mattapan right now. But they did sort of a, a hybrid approach where they had um, multiple ERBs um, in the building going to multiple units. So in this case, each floor had three ERBs and those three RVs each went to multiple units. You can see how that worked. They were ducted into the system. So part of the decision on, on how to do this and whether to do them in each unit or do them um, sort of uh, centralized like this is how you're going to do that duct work is sort of one of the questions that comes up. So here they ran the duct work down the hallway and then from the hallway, they ran it into each of the units. That's one example you're seeing here. Um, the distillery in, that I mentioned in South Boston, they have one ERV in every single unit of the building. So in every unit, there's a little closet, you open it up and there's an ERV right in there. So each project is sort of approaching this a little differently. It's not consistent. Um, even at this point, there's no you know, right way to do it. Some projects do unitize, some do centralized systems. So Go a little bit more into some examples and lessons learned. I'm actually gonna start with the lessons learned and then we'll show some more built examples. And please feel free once again to ask some questions. I'll use the chat room to type anything you're curious about as I go through this. I can address a lot of questions here at the end as well. So lessons learned. These all came from, from project teams who have worked on some of the past past projects already. And these were some of the big takeaways that they wanted to share with everyone else. So first of all, uh, bring your team together early. This is the integrated approach to, to the project. By this, I mean everyone. So you're, it's many people as you can bring in. You want your designer, contractor, uh, MEP engineer, developer, as many people as possible in right away. This includes maybe the past house consultant and past house raider or the person who'll be running your energy model. All these folks, um, the earlier they're involved and the earlier they're all working on this together and towards the same goal, the better this is going to go. Make sure you know where these critical barriers are. So I mentioned the importance of the air barrier and the thermal barrier, um, but there's also the vapor barrier. There's other, other you know, things within this building, but really this is getting at those critical aspects of that building envelope and make sure everyone knows where they are um, and the importance of them. For example, you saw that sign on site that said, you know, don't poke holes in the air barrier. That's one little tiny example of making sure people know the importance of maintaining the air barrier. I'll work with mechanical engineer with experience in low energy buildings. Um, so obviously, I mean, 
if you have somebody who's experienced in passive house projects, that's fantastic. Um, but at the very least, find a mechanical engineer who has experience working with low energy buildings. And the reason that that becomes important is because these buildings, I mean, they use so little energy um, that a lot of the times, you know, you're, they're not, you're not going to be using a traditional heating and cooling system or size system. And we don't want these projects to be oversized. So working with somebody who has experience in low energy can help make sure that your heating and cooling ventilation system you're getting in these buildings are, are designed for, for this low of energy use. Uh, and I'm going to read through all the rest of these here. You can see them on screen, ask questions about them. Um, but there are some of the other aspects to, to sort of the lessons learned. So kickoff meetings, this kind of goes hand in hand with the integrated uh, approach. But basically it means is making sure your team is, is on the right page every at, from the earliest possible. And in this case, every day. So this is making sure you know that the subs who are there each day, that the GC, everybody is on the same page every day and knows, knows what's happening. Uh, build mock-ups on site and use the mock-ups to, to review, say what's happening that day is if there's an aspect of the air bearer being installed that day, use the mock-up to kind of demonstrate it to the team. Um, we showed that example earl, earlier, the plumbing penetrations that are going through. So when, when the, your plumbing trades are there, use the kickoff meeting to talk about that that day. Just use it to make sure you're reminding everyone of, of all these lessons learned and making sure that they know the slight differences in past house projects that they need to pay attention to. Uh, the last note here is also, I, I'll mention, is a good tip is to invite manufacturer reps to these projects. So this includes, you know, whether it's your Windows manufacturer, the, the folks behind these, these air tightness products, um, they, they all want to help you make sure these can install properly and get used right. Um, so invite them to your site. They'll help you. They'll help your team make sure these things are getting used in the right way. And as I said, know your air barrier. Um, this is this came up multiple times, so I mentioned it multiple times. In this case, you can see it on the drawing. It's the red line there, but they're highlighting it. So the drawings in black and white, but they're highlighting the air barrier in red. This might be something they actually show to folks and, and use to to communicate the importance of that air barrier and blower door testing. So obviously this has to be done uh, for the air tightness metric to be, to be hit. But one of the lessons that came up is running this several times throughout different stages of the project. This way you can identify air leaks early and give you a better chance of addressing them if they exist. Um, we also see some teams use smoke testing uh, during this phase. So as they're running the, the blower door test, they'll use a little smoke gun and kind of follow the smoke throughout the building to see where it's leaking. A good way to identify some air leaks. But do it early, and that way you can fix some of them before you get to the end. Some notes on costs of Passive House. Um, cost varies as it does with every project. Uh, so it's hard to give you exact numbers, and I'm not going to give you exact numbers here. But some of the takeaways we've had, especially around multifamily projects, is that we've seen pretty consistently around 2 to 3% lately for um, premiums. So for the cost premium going to Passive House. Uh, we've seen a lot of a lot lower than that as well, um, getting getting close to being completely on par so that you have no premium uh, between with passive house and conventional projects. So the note there, uh, PA has 23, that's referring to Pennsylvania. They were the first state to really go full force and do affordable housing for passive house. They actually offered some incentives to developers um, who were willing to do passive house projects that helped make this possible. Um, but in terms of cost, what they noticed is that the past house projects that were approved for funding had about a zero to 2% cost comparison over the non pass house projects that were approved. And this is without financial incentives specifically for passive house. This is just saying the, the cost between the projects. So that's pretty great. And that's what we're starting to see here in Massachusetts um, is around that two to 3% and we're seeing it get closer to that 0% and complete cost parity for multifamily projects. And really, Interestingly, it's kind of like with the, low, the kind of like with that takeaway on the larger the project, the lower the R value. We're starting to see the, the larger the project, the lower the cost premium, interestingly enough. So now some examples. I'll go through these, ask questions if you have them about each of the projects. I can review more. I'm just going to kind of highlight some of the details I found interesting about each of these. So I'm not going to read through all the details, uh, but we'll start with this one, the Distillery North. This was the first pass house project, the first multifamily pass house project in Massachusetts. So I'd like to start with it, uh, but you can see a photo of it right there. Uh, this was the first pass house project for the teams involved. So for Icon Architecture and Commodore Builders, both have gone on to do other pass house projects now, but this was their first. Um, I'll show you this image here so you can see a little bit about how say the walls were done in this case. So they, this was a wood stud building, used two by eight studs, dense packed with cellulose. 
Uh, and then they covered that with three inches of rock wool insulation. Um, so I actually said they use a zip system sheathing. You can see that green material there first over the, over the um, wood studs. Then they use three inches of rock wall insulation uh, to provide the continuous uh, thermal insulation around the building. And as I mentioned before, they did a unitized approach for ventilation. They also did a unitized approach for heating and cooling. So every single unit had it, their own uh, heat pump in it as well. Uh, this building also has uh, solar energy. So they, in addition to having those heat pumps on the roof, uh, they do have solar, though they share it with a building uh, located next door as well. So they're not fully net zero, but they are near net zero. So here's Finns Cambridge. Uh, this one I mentioned as well, just got completed in, in North Cambridge, 98 units. And this one is all affordable housing. So this is 100% affordable housing complex here. Um, they did this with wood studs as well. And I'll, I'll show, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have another image. Uh, it's gonna show you one, but they did this with wood studs, a blown in fiberglass. So similar to last time, but instead of cellulose, they used fiberglass. Uh, they used the SEGA air barrier system instead of the zip wall system, but again, similar, similar product. And then they, it, were able to use only two inches of mineral wool insulation. So they use the same mineral wool product, but in this building, they use two inches as opposed to three inches of the distillery. Part of the reason they were able to reduce the amount of insulation is that this was a larger project. The distillery is uh, 20, 26 units, this is 98 units. So what you have is a, a lot more sources of heat gain in the building. You have more people, you have more appliances, more electronics, you have more heat being generated. And that's one of the big reasons that when you go to a larger building, you can reduce the amount of thermal insulation. Here's Wheaton College, uh, Pine Hall. This was uh, just completed um, in 2019. So they had students, I believe, in it for the first time in the fall of 2019. Uh, this was a steel uh, frame building. I'll show you some images here. Yeah, you can see this going up here. So they have steel frames. Uh, they dense packed this with mineral wool. So the frames were dense packed with mineral wool. Um, they then used some uh, sheathing on the outside of that. That's the, the yellow product you see there is, is just a sheathing material. Then on top of the sheathing, they used uh, the blue Sega material there, the same product we saw at Finch that provided the, the air barrier around the entire building. Then on top of that, they put mineral wool as well. So they, they put a, con a continuous layer of mineral wool around the whole thing. They did have to do more mineral wool around five inches here. Part of that is the, the steel frame provides a lot more uh, thermal bridging properties than the wood frame does. So they needed a little bit more continuous insulation to help offset the, the thermal bridging. Here is uh, another example. This is Front Flats. This is in Pennsylvania. I mentioned how Pennsylvania sort of led the way in a lot of affordable housing projects. Uh, this one is a market rate project, however, but done by Onion Flats, who is one of the, the companies that has been, been leading the way in those affordable projects. Uh, they're a, a design build firm, so they did everything in-house. But this one was net zero. So this is 28 units of market rate housing, and the first floor is an office space. Um, so they have a combined office and, and multifamily housing. Was interesting, as you can tell from the, the photos, they covered it in solar panels. So they achieved net zero entirely on site by covering the place on the roof and the side of the building here in solar. Uh, the image you see on the left corner is actually looking down that, that wall, that exterior wall. So you're looking vertically down the wall, just so you can see how the solar panels are attached to the wall. But pretty innovative design there. The other aspect of this that was pretty innovative is the panelized construction. So this was built uh, in panels. The wall sections were built offsite in a factory uh, with pre-installed windows like you're seeing in those images. They were then delivered to site and assembled like Legos. So this is something that's growing um, in the passive house world. And I would say in the non-passive house world as, as well, especially in the passive house world, we're seeing more and more projects being built uh, with panelized construction. It's still not the most common thing yet, but it's, it is growing. Um, but this is an example of how it works. Some benefits are you're able to, you know, to have a, a higher level of quality control since you're building everything uh, sort of in a factory setting. You're able to do some air tightness testing and things on, on say, the window penetration of everything in site uh, or in the factory. So you're able to kind of make sure some of these, some of these things are hit. You also reduce um, some of the construction costs because you're lowering the time on site. But some benefits there. So an interesting approach and we're seeing it again sort of increase. Here's some uh, examples of projects going up right now in the Massachusetts area. So I showed some images of Manapan Station, but this one's going up uh, in Manapan right now, a combination of affordable and market rate multifamily housing, but all passive house. Old Colony Phase 3, this will be another one in South Boston, in this case, senior housing, all passive house. Depot Village going up in Hanson, uh, 48 units. Um, 
this being done. So Captain Thompson is the architect. They've done a lot of past house projects up in Maine around the Portland areas. Uh, here's Northland. So this is a very, very large uh, multi-building development going up in Newton. Uh, they had a long, long process to get this approved. And, and throughout that process, they were working with working with the town of Newton, working with some uh, community groups there like Green Newton and others to, to make sure the building was as sustainable as possible. And one of the things that was being pushed very heavily was Passive House. And Northland was interested in it from the beginning. The community was interested in it. So Northland was looking at doing it. They uh, committed to doing three buildings or 280 units of Passive House. As they continued to go through the process of getting this improved and going through their feasibility studies and, and modeling, they decided to increase that. So I still have three buildings written here, but they're actually doing more. I think it's uh, four or five buildings now that are being done to Passive House. Um, so kind of a great example of a project that saw this and, and I've seen the benefits of Passive House and as they go through the process are increasing the amount of units they're building to Passive House. So exciting to see that go up. Um, overall in the state, here's some of the sort of policy initiatives we're seeing around Passive House. So the DHCD, Department of Housing and Community Development, um, has started to incentivize passive house projects when it comes to affordable housing financing. This is based off what Pennsylvania did that had those 23 projects built. So what all this means is in the funding allocation plan, uh, a project that is going to be built to passive house gets some extra points um, accredited to it. But that gives a little bit of incentive for affordable projects to become passive house. We're seeing uh, in the city of Boston, their uh, design standards from the uh, Department of Neighborhood Development have now included passive house as a method for large buildings to meet the zero emission requirements. We're seeing similar initiatives in Somerville and Cambridge to that. So Somerville had a zoning ordinance that includes passive house um, as a method to hit density bonuses. It also requires passive house or something comparable in performance in certain master plan districts. So Union Square, uh, for example, and other areas in Somerville that are have a lot of heavy development will require passive house or at least passive house level performance. In Cambridge, there's also a zoning ordinance that's sort of built in uh, that sees passive house as an alternative pathway. So not any form of requirement, but simply a pathway to, to hit some, some requirements they have. Uh, Newton, uh, as I mentioned with the Northland development, uh, a big push to, to make that as sustainable as possible came from their climate action plan, which includes passive house as well. So we're seeing it sort of included in a lot of towns and cities across the state in these types of zoning ordinances, special permitting processes, uh, climate action plans. A lot of places where towns can sort of throw passive house or zero energy buildings or things like that into requirements, we're seeing it pop up, which is really great to sort of see um, a lot of these places become interested in, in this. Um, in a lot of cases, because these towns have already set their own climate reduction goals, for example, and now they're looking at how do we hit those climate reduction goals and pass files comes up as, as a common option for how to do that. At the state level, uh, the state is doing that exact same thing, has these very tough climate goals to hit um, and is trying to figure out how to do it. Um, so one way to do it is by updating the stretch code in Massachusetts to be a net zero code and to include pass files requirements as part of it. So that is an ongoing process right now. Uh, but the stress code will be updated to some form of, of a net zero code and, and we're hopeful it'll include some passive house requirements as well. And then there's of course mass save which we mentioned which introduced a lot of incentives around passive house and we're expecting more incentives to come out in the next round of that as well. So a lot of initiatives, a lot of growth in passive house in terms of policy and community discussions. So those mass save incentives I was talking about, so these are the current incentives. These are for all uh, residential buildings, five units or more. So that's where we are right now, five units or more. And you can see the incentives that you get. Um, it's up to $3,000 a unit if you're a certified passive house project. They also cover 100% of the cost of a feasibility study, up to 75% of the cost of energy modeling. Um, those, those benefits, the feasibility study, the energy modeling, these are things that any project can enroll for that's, that's thinking about passive house. Um, even if you don't achieve passive house at, at the end, you can still have some of these things covered. So we're, we're encouraging everyone who thinks about passive house as an option for the project to, to enroll in this program, do the feasibility study, start doing the energy modeling, become pre-certified, kind of go through the process. If you become certified, you get that $25,000 per unit bonus. If you do not become certified, there's still a net performance bonus. So that's sort of that bottom uh, row there that talks about the net performance bonus. But basically what this means is if you go through the work, you don't quite become certified, but you're still building a better performing building than, a, than the typical building, 
you still are being awarded for that. You're still getting a little bit of incentive. It's not as much as you would get if you become a certified project, but it's hopefully making it worth it for you to go through this. Our goal though, is to be, have all of these become actual certified passport projects. Right now, uh, I believe we have around 7,500 units. So not billing to 7,500 total units enrolled in this program. Uh, it's what the latest I've heard from Mass Save. So pretty, pretty exciting, pretty exciting there. In addition to buildings, uh, they also provide incentives for uh, professionals to become uh, accredited through certification trainings. So there's lots of different ones out there, but if you are a Massachusetts resident or you work in Massachusetts, uh, you qualify for 50% of the cost of any of these certification trainings. And some of these can be close to $2,000. So 50% uh, reimbursement is pretty significant. And this goes towards you. And I should also mention if, you're, if your company, if your firm is paying for you to do this, the reimbursement still applies to them as well. So no matter who's paying for this, there is a 50% reimbursement. So if you're a firm sending some folks there, make sure you, you apply for this as well. Uh, but this, these are all the upcoming courses. So you have Certified Passout Designer, Consultant, Builder, Trade Person, Raider Verifier. All these courses are coming up. And for the moment, all these courses are being offered online as well. So not just in person, but you can take these online. And even some of them you can take on demand, which means you means rather than watching a live session, you sort of watch a recorded session on your own time. So lots of ways to do this, lots of options. No matter how you do it, you can get 50% reimbursed. So thank you guys so much for this presentation and for being here today and going through it. I will sit around and, and ask some more questions or answer some more questions. I have a couple in the chat room, so I'll get to those first. Uh, but if you have any more, feel free to type them in and ask. But thank you guys so much. Send any questions, that email address right there.